we're going to move on. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Brianne Betcher, who uh, completed her PhD in clinical psychiatry, uh, sorry, clinical psychology with a concentration in neuroscience from Temple University not that long ago in 2010. I swear they get younger and younger. Uh, she completed her internship in clinical neuropsychology at Palo Alto VA Hospital, and she's currently an assistant professor in neurology uh, and works at the uh, neuro, uh, as a neuropsychologist at the Memory and Aging Center at the University of California at uh, San Francisco. She was recently awarded an NIA Career Development uh, Award, and today she's going to talk to us about best practices in diagnosis and treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I know many people here expected uh, Dr. Bruce Miller to be here. I know how exciting it is when you're expecting someone to be here and someone you've never heard of gets to talk to you. Um, so hopefully I can uh, circumvent any of those concerns with, with my talk today. But first, let me um, just give you a little background on who I am and, and uh, why I'm giving this talk today. So as I already mentioned, I'm a neuropsychologist, uh, which means I spend a lot of time thinking about cognition and uh, functioning in individuals across disease spectrum. And so I specifically do a lot of work with healthy aging and thinking about MCI, particular people who are at risk for Alzheimer's disease. Um, so my slant is a little bit more towards thinking about things like memory and attention and how fast we process information. And at UCSF, I see in our clinic and evaluate people who we think might have Alzheimer's disease. So working with people with MCI, Alzheimer's disease, as well as other neurodegenerative disorders like frontal temporal dementia and semantic variant of uh, primary progressive aphasia. So that's a little bit about my background. Um, so today I'm going to mainly be talking about best practices in the diagnosis of uh, and treatment of Alzheimer's disease with a little more emphasis on the diagnosis section of it. Okay, and then these are my disclosures. So uh, this is NIH, NIA, as well as Alzheimer's Association. Okay, and just to give you an overview of what I hope to accomplish today and, and what we're going to talk about some, um, first, there's going to be some overlap, I think, with uh, uh, Dr. Peterson's excellent talk that he just gave in the sense that I will also go through a little bit of the, the new NIAAA uh, guidelines and also give some case examples of that. But really the overarching goal of this is to give you a sense of how I go through and think about cases through uh, via a clinician's perspective while also talking about these changes in conceptual conceptualization um, and diagnoses. I also will move into a little bit of modifiable risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, which I think is sort of part and parcel related to treatment options for, for Alzheimer's disease as well. So thinking about things that um, are uh, responsible for some of the variability that we see um, in course. And then finally, I will touch on treatment options for AD. Like I said, I'm a neuropsychologist. I'm not a physician. And so more specific discussions or questions about um, uh, medications will probably be best for the panel in a little bit. Okay, so to start off with, I'm going to discuss uh, Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. And just give you a little initial case history here of Miss A.D. So this is a 51-year-old woman with progressive memory impairment. She also suffers from delusions, some period of being uh, slightly agitated, poor sleep, and also having some hoarding behavior. On neurological exam, uh, she was shown to be disoriented to time and place, um, having very, very poor memory, having responses that are often just completely incoherent, and repeatedly muttering to herself. And so for those of you who know the history of Alzheimer's disease, this is the, the first initial case that Alzheimer described in 1906 for Augusta Dieter. And this was a case of what they referred to at that time as pre-senile dementia with um, amnesia and psychosis. And when they looked at her brain upon autopsy, you noticed that there were these amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. And this is sort of the classic seminal case that um, really initiated work on Alzheimer's disease. Although is, I, I wouldn't say necessarily atypical, but not the, the garden variety common uh, idea of what Alzheimer's disease looks like clinically. And this is, I know you've probably seen already image of this today, but just to give you a sense here of uh, what this would look like underneath the microscope. And so 
uh, amyloid plaques right here in blue, and then neurofibrillary tangles. These are made of tau. Um, and so these are what you would see under a pathological level. And as we've also already discussed today and heard um, some great comments earlier by uh, Dr. Peterson, we know that AD is an impending health crisis, that we have 5.6 million Americans that have Alzheimer's disease. By 2025, this number is going to reach over 7 million and increase beyond there. We also know that a treatment that would delay this disease onset by five years would reduce the cost by 57%. So there's a lot of impetus and interest in really trying to get earlier therapies and understand when this disease starts. So let me move on to what these classic cases of Alzheimer's disease look like in a clinical setting. And this should feel familiar to, to clinicians in, in the room. So this is a case of someone uh, I'll refer to as the forgetful veteran. And this gentleman is a 70-year-old right-handed veteran with diabetes, high cholesterol, so some vascular risk factors that we often see in our patients. He comes in with a complaint that his memory is terrible. And when speaking with his wife, she notes that in the last 12 months, he is forgetting conversations, um, TV programs that he's watched. He's repeating questions over and over again in stories. Um, that his memory for remote events, so events that happened a long time ago, um, including things that happened in his childhood or early years when he was married, all of these seemed to be spared. Um, that he was getting a little more quiet in social settings, so uh, not initiating uh, discussion as much. And last month, uh, lost his way home from an endocrine appointment in San Francisco. So this is a fairly typical presentation that I often hear in clinic when I'm working with, uh, with patients that I suspect might have Alzheimer's disease. And why I say it's typical is that it's very memory predominant. Um, so the, although saying that someone has memory problems is often what we hear in clinic, even when we have another diagnosis, I think this is a, a fairly good example of uh, the types of symptoms that we often hear about. So when you have a patient like this present, I like to go through and think about what are the different ways I'm going to ascertain the information that's going to be most helpful for me for diagnosis as well as for treatment. So this is really the approach to a patient with cognitive complaints. And first I'm really thinking about the history of the presenting illness, so the HPI, and going through these different domains in detail. And as a neuropsychologist, I, I tend to probe these areas uh, quite a bit because they're so multifaceted. Even when we say something like memory problems, that can be divided up into um, difficulties encoding information, retrieving information, consolidating it. These are very different problems that actually point to different uh, neuroanatopical substrates as well. So I tend to ask a lot of questions about this. And I really can't stress enough how important it is to listen to the patients and listen to the families and hear what they're telling you are the very first symptoms that they had. This will give you some sort of evidence as to where the pathology is possibly starting. Um, this is not only helpful with Alzheimer's disease, but also with uh, patients with frontal temporal dementia and um, other neurodegenerative diseases. It can really give you a window into what they're experiencing above and beyond the testing. So, for example, I will ask them questions about memory, and this could be things like misplacing items, uh, missing appointments, failing to pay, pay bills. Um, if it's repetitive speech, I'll oftentimes follow up with questions to say, you know, if you remind the patient uh, or the loved one of uh, the conversation that you just had, did they recognize it? Did, they, did this information seem familiar to them, or is it as if it never happened? Um, so really trying to get a little bit closer at whether or not they're having a hard time consolidating the information or if it's just a matter of it's in there but they can't quite get it when they need it. Um, other areas of cognition that I usually will go through include uh, visual spatial skills. So this can include things like getting lost um, while driving, difficulties recognizing faces. And I say visual spatial a little bit loosely in the sense that although we often think about this as more parietal, so more posterior in the brain, um, things like recognizing faces is also um, more ventral, so uh, lower down in the brain in the temporal lobes as well as occipital lobes. So it's not just your classic parietal 
um, symptoms. Also, we'll ask things about language, so language production, comprehension, reading and writing, because there's also been changes to uh, other diagnostic criteria for uh, semantic variant, primary progressive aphasia, and non-fluent variant, um, as well as something I'll talk about in a little bit called logopenic progressive aphasia. I often ask additional questions with language as well, such as when the individual is uh, talking on the phone with a friend or a loved one, do they have a hard time keeping track of that information when they have no other inputs besides just auditory? For some of these illnesses that can be due to Alzheimer's disease, one of the first symptoms is difficulties holding that kind of information in mind. Um, I think many of us are also familiar with things like executive functioning. It's this very large, broad domain that includes so many different things, uh, including judgment, decision making, multitasking. It can be due to changes um, in your frontal lobes. It can also be due to changes in your white matter tracts or areas of the brain called the basal ganglia. And very importantly, I also ask about behavior, um, any sort of personality changes, um, and it needs to be a change. So if this was someone who might have been difficult their whole life, that's, that's less relevant to the diagnosis. But specifically changes uh, in personality that have occurred over the, the past few years or once the symptoms have started. Um, also involved in that is uh, things like apathy and depression. Uh, we're learning more and more that some of these psychiatric symptoms, if they have an onset later in life, that is a red flag. That is something that is saying that your brain is changing and should raise concern. And so we often delve more into that as well. And then finally also thinking about motor changes. So any sorts of change in gait, falls, tremors, things like that. So what can cognitive testing do for you? Um, in these settings, I think there, there are certainly times when um, the history will tell you most everything you need to know. Um, there are other times, however, that cognitive testing can be very helpful. And I think those are the cases when there are some uh, diagnostic quandaries, not quite sure whether memory is actually the primary area of impairment or if it's executive functioning. Um, it can also help you better define uh, which areas are spared. Um, that's helpful not only in terms of diagnosis, but also helpful in terms of, uh, in my opinion, working with families and helping them determine what the, what the patient can do and what they'll thrive with doing. So not just focusing on the areas of loss, but focusing on strengths as well. Um, and then finally, an uh, approach to working with patients with cognitive complaints is are doing these other studies to help rule out treatable causes, um, and also, as we'll discuss later, uses uh, biomarkers as well to see if this is actually something due to underlying Alzheimer's disease. Okay, and then when we think about the clinical evolution of Alzheimer's disease, again, I'm focusing on the clinical first here before we move on to underlying pathology. This is sort of the evolution that we're thinking about. So with normal aging, you can have um, some declines. You shouldn't expect declines in everything by any means, but we do see subtle declines in things like how fast you process information. It actually peaks in, in your 20s. Um, so for many of us, myself included, we, we have probably seen better days with processing speed. Um, executive functioning and naming and, and memory uh, are also things that can subtly decline over time as well. And again, I don't want to highlight that this is a major loss by any means. There's so much heterogeneity with, with typical aging and people who really sustain over time. But on average, these are the things that are more difficult with normal aging. We also see improvements, which I, which I wish were really highlighted more, um, improvements in terms of vocabulary, general knowledge, wisdom, things that are less mediated by how fast we are, but more about the information that we've garnered over many, many years of time. So that's on this side of the spectrum. As we move more towards Alzheimer's disease, we have mild cognitive impairment. So this can be decline in memory or other cognitive domains. It does not have to be just memory, and we're finding more and more that there are plenty of presentations that don't present with memory as the primary complaint. It's beyond what is expected for age. So this is important because you don't want to conflate normal aging with MCI. Um, these are different uh, constructs. So this is above and beyond what we might expect for someone's age and education level. 
Um, it's not interfering dramatically with day-to-day -day functioning. That doesn't mean that it can't be interfering some at a higher level. Um, examples of that would be maybe uh, more difficulties balancing a checkbook or doing online banking, but still able to perform most all uh, functions on a day-to-day -day basis. Most, uh, mild cognitive impairment by itself has multiple causes. Um, so Alzheimer's disease is one of them, but there can be other causes, including vascular disease, frontal temporal lobar degeneration. There's quite a few others as well. So it may or may not progress to Alzheimer's disease. Then we get to the point where we have someone who actually does have Alzheimer's disease, and it's very similar to MCI, except for the fact that um, it's interfering with their day-to-day -day functioning. So that's really one of the primary bases for thinking about what dementia is. And I want to point that out because I think uh, previously or for a long time it was suggested that there was this Alzheimer's uh, dementia diagnosis and then there was this sort of nebulous other ground. It has nothing to do with the underlying pathology. This is all on a spectrum. So dementia primarily means that it's interfering with your day-to-day -day functioning. It doesn't necessarily say that you didn't have a, a pathological process before that. Okay. And I think what's really important and the way the diagnostic criteria have been moving is to think first about clinical syndrome, so what the patient is presenting with, with their symptoms, and then moving towards what the pathology is and trying to disentangle those and not use them synonymously. So we start off with the very careful clinical syndrome that we've obtained in the office and working with family members and the patients. And from that, we're moving towards the pathology. And I'll go through the various ways that we do that with biomarkers. Um, so one of the ways that we think about this is doing structural MRI. Um, and you can see here uh, in this scan, I, don't, I can't tell if that's clear for you over there. Um, you do see cortical atrophy in Alzheimer's disease, so changes to the gray matter, the neurons um, making up the brain. Oftentimes we see changes in the temporal parietal cortex. Um, that just means the, the junction there, so you're getting some parietal, also temporal, also medial temporal lobe structures like your hippocampus, your parahippocampal gyrus, entorhinal cortex. Um, and those areas are very important for memory, specifically memory consolidation, so not being able to maintain information over time. They're also very important for language, and so you get uh, word finding problems. Um, also math, which I think is not talked about a lot and is often not an initial symptom of classic Alzheimer's disease, but another one that we're going to be talking about in a minute, it's often an early symptom. and. Uh, the, the word is called acalculia, so some of these patients present with inability to work with numbers. And you see that in the angular gyrus, which is right at that temporal parietal junction. Also seeing difficulties with navigation, spatial reasoning, and this is also part and parcel of temporal parietal cortex. Additional atrophy that you can see is lateral frontal cortex, so near the front of the brain up here. And um, we know that medial frontal cortex is often spared, which is often um, why you also see why many social graces in early stages of Alzheimer's disease are often, um, are often spared. Whereas you contrast that with someone with frontal temporal dementia, where social graces and uh, behavior are often the first symptoms that something is going awry in their brain networks. Okay, and this is just an image to give you a sense of change in the hippocampus, which was one of the major structures that we think is affected in Alzheimer's disease over time. So moving from when the person was normal all the way down to when they have an official Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. And you should see that the red part there is getting smaller over time. Okay, and then the next topic I wanted to, to bring up was uh, these biomarkers, which I think we've already heard a lot about today, and I'll try to delve a little bit more into in terms of how they might relate in the future to clinical diagnoses. Um, one biomarker that is available that we use in the clinic um, is detecting AD pathology in cerebral spinal fluid. And in this, you'll see if someone, if we think someone has likely AD, you would expect a pattern of CSF changes where you have decrease in A beta 42, an increase in uh, total tau and phosphotau. 
And this ratio here, whoops, this ratio here has been shown to be fairly accurate in predicting pathology confirmed cases of Alzheimer's disease and predicting conversion from MCI to AD. So this is one marker that, that can be used and we uh, often use sometimes at the memory and aging center that I work at. Other biomarkers that have been discussed today include brain hypometabolism uh, through FDG PET. Um, this is often a, a marker of synaptic dysfunction, so the, the parts of the cells that connect and communicate with each other. So the cooler areas there would be showing hypometab hypometabolism or reduced glucose uptake, which would be concerning. We've also heard a lot about imaging amyloid plaques, so I won't get too much into that. Um, I work with Gil Rabinovich here and uh, Bill Jagus, who are at UCSF in Berkeley. And we spent a lot of time thinking about amyloid imaging and how that might be predictive of, uh, and useful uh, in diagnosing in a research setting. And just to give you a, some sense of, of how this has looked in research, um, this is from a study by Clark in JAMA, and this came out in 2011. And this is showing you uh, the PIP scan, so imaging uh, amyloid. And those scans are on the left, and on the right here, you have autopsy, and you can see the nice parallel there between the level of PIB uptake on this tracer with the pathology upon autopsy. This is sort of a nice uh, proof of concept as well and, and helps us really start to develop more faith in the fact that this is targeting amyloid and something that we can use in clinical trials and are currently being used in clinical trials. And this is also to show you that PIB uptake um, in normal, healthy elderly, so people who are not showing clinical evidence of MCI or any manifestation of Alzheimer's disease, um, that whether or not they have higher PIB uptake is related to smaller hippocampi, smaller cortical uh, areas in the brain as well. So you're actually starting to see, even in healthy people, that there is a direct relationship between these biomarkers and structural, uh, structural scans. And this has already been shown several times today. Just reiterate it because it's been um, a fairly influential model in thinking about the biomarker cascade. And to quickly run through it again, this is by Clifford Jack. This was in uh, Lancet in 2010. The, the whole model for this is to really think about what is the trajectory of these biomarkers and how can we use this to understand the uh, manifestation of clinical symptoms and when we can actually intervene with clinical trials. Um, and I think this is also part and parcel of why it's so important to think about clinical syndrome and then underneath that to think about the pathology and not necessarily conflate the two. So based on tremendous animal work as well as human work. They've shown that what they think is the earliest changes in Alzheimer's disease is this um, alteration in A-beta. So if you see this increased uptake in A-beta on PIB, which we've already talked about, that should be the earliest sign. And this has been shown to be evident 10 years prior uh, to clinical manifestation. So it's a very, very early marker. Secondary to that, so next in the, in the trajectory line, we would think about tau-mediated neuronal injury and dysfunction. You can see that in the blue line right here, these sigmoid functions. And then close in time after that, you'll, you'll start to see changes in brain function, memory, and finally clinical functioning there. But you can see, and I think what's most striking about this is that um, as the amyloid increases, it reaches a peak before you even really begin to see the MCI manifestations. Um, and the reason I point that out is that there have been many, many failed trials, as you all know, with medications. And one of the many thoughts that have uh, gone into it that have helped kind of refashion and remodel the future trials is whether or not we're too late in the process. So at the time that you actually have someone presenting that has clinical manifestations, are we targeting that too late in the amyloid process? That doesn't mean it's too late for other interventions, but possibly for amyloid, we would need to move much, much further back in order to adequately prevent or treat. This is, again, just to give you a sense of what those biomarkers would look like, the progression.
Now from that, there's been, um, I, I would say, a very healthy and spirited debate about the, the new guidelines that have come out. Um, uh, sometimes it was probably less spirited, but um, so this is an article, Introduction to the Recommendations for the NIAA a, a Work Group on the Diagnostic Guidelines for Alzheimer's Disease. And this was really partially predicated on that model that I just showed you, where we believe that A beta deposition occurs early, it occurs before you have any symptoms. This progresses to MCI AD when you start to have evidence of neuronal injury. So when you look at a scan, you start to see changes in hippocampus and other areas. Um, and that this will progress into dementia due to Alzheimer's disease when you actually start seeing much more greater impact on cognition and function. And so this is part of the background for these guidelines. And I'm gonna go through all the guidelines even though some of them are much more used for, uh, for research. And I, I wanna highlight that because I don't want to give the impression that you should go to your doctor and start asking for these biomarkers. That is, that is not the goal. Um, I think the goal, moreover, is to give you a sense of where this field is headed. And these are part of the guidelines right now, but are primarily used for research uh, emphasis. The reason for that is that these biomarkers, there's still so much research that needs to be done on them. So even if you have um, things like CSF for, for tau levels, depending on um, what company processes them, you can have different results. We don't quite know yet what to do with conflicting results and what that means. So if you have evidence of, of A beta, but you don't have evidence of neuronal degeneration or you have conflicting even within those, we don't quite know what that means for your own personal trajectory. So there's a lot of caution against using these biomarker guidelines for clinical settings. I do want to talk about them, though. I think they're important to think about, and they are being implemented in some ways, particularly with the uh, Amavid scans being approved for clinical use. Okay, to start off with, um, I'm going to come back to the preclinical, but I want to start with the ones that um, can be used for, for clinical use. What I have up here are the biomarker guidelines, but I'm going to take a brief step back and talk about the core clinical criteria. Um, so this work group, uh, you can see here, Marilyn Albert and uh, a long list of really well-respected individuals came up with MCI due to Alzheimer's disease. Again, I hope you can tell here the, the pattern here that they're really trying to differentiate what is the clinical syndrome and what do we think that it's due to, which will help us think more about what is the appropriate treatment. Um, I think it's also important to, to highlight that some of these failed drug trials, um, like we saw uh, a year or two ago with bapaminazab and, and several others, they went back and looked and 30% of the people didn't actually have Alzheimer's disease. And so the idea is that we really, really need to think through these biomarkers and make sure that when we call a, a, a failed trial really failed, that we actually have people with Alzheimer's disease in those trials. Um, I thought that number was really striking and really, really discouraging, and so I, I think um, it's provided a big impetus to, to think more about this. Okay, so the, the core clinical criteria for MCI, which you've already gone over a little bit, uh, was Dr. Peterson. You need to have a cognitive complaint, um, and interestingly, that can come from the patient, the patient's family. It can also come from a, a, a doctor, um, so the doctor can be the person that has this concern about cognition that they've noticed as well. You also need to have some sort of objective impairment on testing. Um, that can be bedside testing, so it doesn't have to be a formal neuropsychological examination. I think that's important to point out because um, there are certain areas, there are many, many rural areas that do not have access to neuropsychologists. I come from a very, very small town in Texas, and I certainly, um, my family would have never had access to these kinds of things and still don't. I think it's important that these clinical criteria are applicable to all settings um, uh, for use. So you do need to have some evidence, but it can be bedside evidence. Oftentimes it will be memory, but not always. Memory is typically the, the area of cognition that's most predictive of Alzheimer's disease, but we've learned more and more that that's not always the case. So it's not restricted to memory as being the primary one. <clears throat> 
You need to not have a major functional impairment. So again, you can have some changes maybe in bill paying and higher level uh, activities of daily living, but nothing that greatly impairs your ability to function. And of course, you can't be demented. So that's the clinical, the first part of the clinical syndrome. The second part of the clinical syndrome asks them, uh, the physician to think about possible etiological considerations. So that will be things like making sure that there aren't other causes to the presentation. So ruling out things like tumors and major vascular disease. Also ruling out things like frontal temporal dementia and other neurodegenerative diseases that uh, could be presenting similarly. So you're still asked, even in a clinical setting without these biomarkers, to think about possible etiological um, changes there. Um, you're also permitted to think about genetic risks as well. So even though it's not part of the diagnosis per se, it's not a requirement, uh, thinking about family history, really getting a, a good family history to see if there's an autosomal dominant pattern there is important. Um, I think they'll talk more about that in the, in the next talk with the Diane study, uh, thinking about presenilin 1, presenilin 2, APP gene. Uh, so that's what we're talking about with the core clinical criteria. It can be applied anywhere. You don't need access to these biomarkers, but you should still be using the same mental framework of thinking about clinical presentation and underlying etiology. Um, so that's MCI core clinical criteria. That's what it also means by um, biomarker probability uninformative. Um, that can mean that you've had access to biomarkers and they have not been informative or you have not had access to biomarkers due to costs or resources. So you can still use MCI core clinical criteria. Then there's also this MCI due to AD with an intermediate likelihood, with the intermediate probability of an underlying A beta etiology. And in this case, you can have uh, one or the other as a positive marker. So you could have A beta or markers of neuronal injury. Either one would give you an inter intermediate, but you can't have tested both and gotten one to be uninformative or conflicting. So you can only have tested one at that point and the other one has been untested. And then, whoops, high likelihood down here would be uh, if you have tested both and they're both positive. I think that's, that's fairly intuitive there. And I want to run through a quick case of an atypical presentation. And the reason I'm going to go through this is to really give you a sense of when use of biomarkers might be helpful. And it was already discussed a little bit earlier today in cases where you have a diagnostic quandary, where it's not a straightforward case of Alzheimer's disease, but you think it still possibly could be due to an Alzheimer's disease process. So this is a case of a 54-year-old practicing internist with two years of progressive word finding difficulties. So she's struggling to come up with words that should be familiar to her. Um, which is very embarrassing to her in, in the context of her work. She's feeling less efficient uh, at accomplishing tasks. This has not impacted daily functioning, though. So the main thing I want to point out here that most everything is normal, including her memory. What was uh, impaired was her language testing. So she had fluent speech, meaning that she was getting out words. She wasn't, um, there wasn't any motor problem with getting out the, the speech, but she had word finding pauses. She had poor repetition. So if I would read her a sentence, she would have, she would start to lose the last part of that sentence. The longer it was, the less able she was able to hold on to it. She had difficulties on uh, naming tasks, um, but other aspects of language were fine. So her semantics were fine. And here is a video, if we can play that. Okay, so this is a, uh, a case where she was initially asked to just describe the picture in front of her. And most healthy people will be able to describe really rich details about this picture, about what they're doing, about um, the person flying the kite. And you can tell that she had some word finding problems there. And then she also had some difficulties with uh, repeating a short, a short phrase. So her basic workups were pretty normal. She had this kind of classic MRI, MRI read that says age appropriate. It's hard to know what that means. Um, and so you have these questions. Is this normal aging? No, I don't think that this is normal aging. These are very pronounced concerns in a young woman. Um, if not, what is the diagnosis? Could this still be Alzheimer's disease? Should I start taking Aricept? 
So this is a case where biomarkers really helped us. She didn't have a classic, typical AD phenotype. We did FDG PET. She um, had that hypometabolism in parietal area. She had positive PIB uptake. We diagnosed her with MCI due to AD, and this was someone with logopenic progressive aphasia, which is most often due to Alzheimer's disease as an underlying pathology. Again, the clinical syndrome was logopenic aphasia. The etiology was Alzheimer's disease, someone that would still benefit from a cholinesterase inhibitor. That's why it's important to think about these etiologies, because those medications can still help. Um, this was already discussed uh, by Dr. Peterson. Um, again, this is diagnosis of the dementia, and so you want to have impairment in day-to-day -day functioning. What I really want to point out here is that you do need to think about other etiological causes, again, like semantic variant dementia, frontal temporal dementia. Make sure that you rule those out, particularly in these unusual presentations of Alzheimer's disease where you might see more behavioral uh, impairments. Okay, I'm just going to skip through that. We've also briefly talked about the preclinical stages. Again, these are strictly for research use. These are not for clinical use in any way. Um, but I think are so very helpful for uh, the clinical trials that have just started and clinical trials that are being planned currently to think about how we can intervene early to even prevent cognitive decline in these downstream neurodegenerative processes from occurring. And we have very, and this is very, very biomarker heavy because the person doesn't have any cognitive complaints. They're asymptomatic for the most part. Um, and Dr. Peterson already talked about this briefly. I think these will be really critical for the trials. And there are already some that are going on, the, like the A4 trial uh, by uh, Dr. Risa Sperling, who's looking at asymptomatic people who are PIB positive and, and starting them on uh, solimuzumab. I think these are very, very important uh, things to think about and very exciting for us. This is one of the first few years I've been even more excited about some of the upcoming trials that are focused on these preclinical stages. Um, this is just quickly showing that these preclinical stages seem to be predictive over time. So if you break them apart between stage one, two, and three, you do see the progression to MCI that you would expect just to, to validate, that just came out in the last, uh, very recently. I'm running out of time, and I know you've already talked a little bit about modifiable risk factors, but I just want to briefly, briefly mention this if I can. This is very near and dear to my heart. I, I study modifiable risk factors. Um, I really want to, to move research more into this area of uh, heterogeneity in course and why do we see some people do very well and others don't who have similar cognitive presentations, similar risk factors, uh, I'm sorry, similar uh, courses before that. And what we know is that brain pathology under the microscope does not always have this one-to-one -one correlation with clinical manifestation. We know that if through the NUN studies, the religious order studies, that there are uh, nuns who died who were not demented, did not have cognitive impairment, but had brains that were riddled with Alzheimer's disease. So what kept them healthy? What kept them going? And that's what we're really studying here. This is what I study. I look at um, vascular risk factors and inflammation and how, whoops, how those, uh, how those can impact trajectories. And we know that head traumas, so multiple concussions, can contribute to this, to this progress as well. Genetics, with vascular risk factors, things like obesity, um, not working out. Whereas on the other side, you see decreased risk for people that have increased mental activity, increased physical activity. I think there's tremendous evidence to suggest that this will be helpful in people who have AD, people who have MCI, people who are not even currently at risk. And part of the reason I'm so excited about physical exercise, and there's a trial going on right now uh, at Wake Forest looking at MCI and exercise, um, is the animal literature is robust. It's, it's really incredible showing things like brain-derived neurotrophic factor increasing in your hippocampus, which helps increase neurogenesis. There are known mechanisms as to why this might help. Uh, in human studies, we're seeing very similar things. So if you follow people who exercise, um, you're seeing changes in their hippocampus that are very beneficial. And I won't go deeply into this because they've already been discussed a little bit earlier today. 
but they're also very tightly related to exercise. And what's good for your brain, or sorry, what's good for your heart is good for your brain. So really monitoring atherosclerosis, um, cerebral vascular disease, cardiovascular disease, and inflammation. We know that inflammation is related to memory. It was already talked about earlier today as well. And just briefly with the treatment options, if we find a treatment that can delay Alzheimer's disease by even a couple of years, we'll see such dramatic declines in the rates of Alzheimer's disease. Um, I'm sorry, not treatments. If we can delay the onset by two years, we'll see such dramatic decreases in the rates of Alzheimer's disease, um, which makes these preclinical trials so very important. These are the typical medications we often use for Alzheimer's disease. Um, I think many of you will be familiar with them, like Aricept, uh, Namenda. They work on, uh, you know, Mimitine works on, uh, it's an NMDA receptor agonist, whereas the rest are cholinesterase, cholinesterase inhibitors. All right, I'm just going to skip past that really fast. Um, we also think about psychiatric symptoms, so depression, making sure that if you see a patient in your, in your clinical setting that you're asking about these questions. These are such important areas for quality of life. Um, thinking about SSRIs again, uh, sometimes we use atypical neuroleptics, avoiding neuroleptics, avoiding benzodiazepines. In future directions, the Diane talk uh, next will give you a great idea about the autosomal dominant um, trials that are going on right now. There's also a trial in Colombia with, um, with a family. Uh, there, there's a large family there, but they're going to be looking at 100 people who have this autosomal dominant gene and looking at treatment with them. There's also the A4 trial that I already mentioned, looking at asymptomatic people who are at PIB positive. We also have so many other different things that are coming up. There's these anti tau therapies that we're working on, immunotherapy, there's anti-epileptics, anti um, which we've seen uh, Alzheimer's disease patients often have increased subclinical seizures. Um, so really thinking about treatments that will, that will uh, ameliorate that as well. All right, thank you. Sorry that last part was rushed. I'm happy to talk with any of you more about treatment options and uh, different therapies as well. So we have time for a few I was minutes. just curious on the uh, exercise. Is it aerobic, um, like a, a slight increase in the heart rate, or is yes, there a specific it's aerobic. time? It's aerobic. I have a funny story about that. Um, so they, they often do aerobic versus stretching, and aerobic seems the one, to be the one that really is giving you the most bang for your buck. Um, I had a patient recently where I told him how important it was that he exercise, and he said, well, I often sit in my hot tub every night. <laughs> And I said, if that was exercise, we would all be doing it multiple times a day. That is not. With a that's, we glass of Chardonnay, too. Your heart, heart beating fast. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. I had a Hi. question about, um, is there any data on first-degree relatives of those who have an APOE4? In other words, do the children of APOE4 carriers have a higher risk, even if they don't have APOE4? Any data on that? I don't know that genetic work as well. Um, I mean, we know that APO, APOE4 carries a uh, greater risk, and I was showing it the, very quickly at the end there. I don't know as much about people who have, uh, who do not ca carry APOE4, but have had family members in there. But we can ask that on the panel. <laughs> 